Hi, I'm Freddie from Muddy Waters Capital, and I'm here today with Saren Andal of Blue Orca Capital, and we're going to be uh, presenting the short of it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Carson has fully recovered from COVID and uh, has suspect monkeypox. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a great supporter of, of the, you know, the monkeypox pandemic. And so for, as long as he's out, I'm willing to step in. And, and, and that was a joke. Is. Carson does not have monkeypox. <laughs> I've tested this morning. I don't have monkeypox either. Soren? I'm pretty sure I don't have monkeypox, but you know, it's, it's only three o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've had COVID enough times by this point. <laughs> So I, I know nothing about monkeypox, and I, I guess the one thing I find interesting, despite knowing nothing about it, is everyone is pretty relaxed at the moment about monkeypox. And I actually remember people being pretty relaxed about COVID. Um, yeah, well, monkeypox is funnier early or in the monkeypox pandemic than COVID. Okay. COVID arguably was never really funny. No. Monkeypox suffers from the fact that it's just like arguably hilarious right from the beginning, um, which is probably not great um, for preventing monkeypox, but. Right, it is sexually transmitted, I think. Yeah, that's what they say um, yeah. in like a really aggressive way. Like apparently you have to have like open sores in order to sexually transmit it. That's why I think like monkeypox is probably worse for mental health than COVID because like if you get monkeypox, there's a real chance your self-esteem goes like materially down. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Carson, if you do get monkeypox, don't let your self-esteem go down. <laughs> um, so, you know, usually we'll kind of talk on this about like recent reports from short sellers and Sometimes Carson and I have talked about reports from short sellers we think are inadequate, and sometimes we talk about stuff we think is really good. And I, I think this is actually standalone, an interesting topic. Mm. Should short sellers criticize other short sellers? You know, that's an interesting topic. I mean, we always get asked, right? Like, you're a short seller, you're an activist. Do you read the other activist short selling that's published in the market? Um, of course you do. It's like your 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 job and your business to sort of understand what's going on in the market, understand how other, you know, no matter who it is, basically is, you know, what type of thesis, what type of evidence, what's the reaction to it. Um, and just like any other sort of profession, there are some that you read that you're like, this was great. This mm -hmm. is really impressive work. And then others that you're like, this is kind of laughable. This is, this is garbage. Um, the question is, do you like, you know, even though you're in a very good position to basically weigh the mm -hmm. strength of other people's work on the short side, there's, I think, a general hesitancy in, mm -hmm. in the community to kind of criticize. And I don't know if that's justified or not. I think, like, I can see, I can see both sides. What do you think about it? That's a really good question. I, I think there's a difference between, like, these really ad hominem personal attacks and yeah. actual criticism of the work. There are people I like who... I think either have theses that are just like not particularly profound or well trafficked. And so they kind of fit into that. Yeah, you're probably correct, but hmm. like, you know, I've seen you do better work kind of stuff. And yeah. then, yeah, I genuinely think there are people whose work is just uninteresting and it's, it's kind of sloppy. And I, I kind of wonder how they reach those conclusions sometimes. I guess the, you know, the issue with the criticism piece is it's a really small industry. Like most activist short sellers know other activist yeah. short sellers or have worked for other activist short sellers. So, you know, we get enough criticism from the outside world in yeah. general yeah, exactly. that like the kind of, you know, friendly fire yeah. is, um, is probably not something we massively welcome. Um, I, I mean, look, look, I think when you're analyzing an issue which, which like touches on short sellers, one of the, the mental models that I always use is basically how do long investors behave in like a similar context? Mm -hmm. And, you know, do long investors do like, you know, do, do long hedge funds like criticize the sort of public activist short stances of other long hedge funds? Like occasionally, but I mm -hmm. think it's like a... You know, in general, if they can disagree, they usually kind of disagree. Mm -hmm. You know, you're it's a free market, and that's the whole point, right? You're allowed to take the other side of the bet if you really think right. it's it's wrong. Um, yeah, so. I mean, that's I mean, actually speaking of that, I mean, the, and kind of coming back to your point, I do like if I find like a really good research technique 
to copy that. Like there are occasionally short pieces I've yeah. seen from other short sellers. And I'm like, wow, you know, I looked at that company and I had an inkling. I mean, one that kind of recently came to mind was uh, like, Nate uh, had a piece on uh, the the birth testing thing, um, Natera. Yeah. And it was it was like something we kind of looked at. We knew there was this like funky little five hundred one C three piece, mm. and like you know there were kind of like rumors from some formers that like maybe there was something untoward. And he'd actually gone a step further than I've been able to prove, and he kind of actually connected the dots in terms of how much of revenue it responsible for and. Uh, I think there was like an undisclosed related party angle. And so like sometimes you see that and you're like, wow, I, I kind of really <laughs> missed something. Um, Does that piss you off? Do you ever get like... It, it's a really good question. It's, I it's, think... That's a tough one. It's a tough one when you've looked at something and then someone who you respect in the space, like you're happy for them that they, yeah. that they did good work. And, you know, I think Nate does great work in general. And, and I'm ha- you know, but it's, there's also an element of it when you see it, you're like, you know, you're kind of pissed at yourself and your own process. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm pissed at myself. I'm yeah, thinking like, right. hey, I could have gone further. I could have thought about that harder. Where I'm pissed off at the other short activist is if we're working on something and we're taking our time and we're like really going through the motions to make sure there are very few to no unknown unknowns. Mm. And someone puts something out that's like sloppy. It's kind of... 65% of what I'm doing, and I'm just like, fuck, you've like ruined the kind of crescendo y <laughs> surprise thing. This work is like, it's not incorrect. It's just like what I then have is like incremental as opposed to brand new information. And like, yeah, I'm, I'm fucking furious. I mean, if we've been working on something for like months, I, I'm like just beside myself. I mean, I feel so sorry for my colleagues on those days because I'm such a short-tempered, irritable fuck. <laughs> um, so that that for me is like the biggest pain point. And yeah, I'm hypercritical of that work. I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't find this. And like, this really sucks. And like, God, what a hack. This person should just like not be allowed to put short reports out. But really, that's just me being pissed off. Right, right. No, it is super frustrating, especially when you feel like someone has rush something to market they've it's poor construction it's obviously impatient there's you know they didn't do a proper job on it that for sure sucks but mm. it doesn't happen as much as it used to yeah speaking of other things that mm. uh people haven't done a great job of <laughs> private investing <laughs> well i mean i wouldn't go so that far tiger global apparently only marked its uh, privates down nine percent that's true and i yeah. don't think d1 have marked <laughs> <laughs> I heard, I don't know if this is true, but one of my friends who, who was very familiar with the space told me that D1 was up, was up last year because even though their public investments lost, they were, they were boarded like a 25% yearly gain based on the markup of their private, or they're based on like a markup, a large markup, like 70% of their privates. I don't know if that's true, but if it's I, close to being true. If it's even, and, and, and I think the, the directionally, the, the rumor also tells you a lot about the truth of the market in a way. Like, I think yeah. that practice is really common. And, mm-hmm. you know, it kind of gets this big discussion that we're having in the market now, which is what everyone asks you as a short seller, which is where's the bottom, mm-hmm. right? Where is, oh, this thing is sold off 80%. Surely it's a buy, mm-hmm. stuff like that. It's hilarious for a couple of reasons. One, we don't know shit about where the bottom is, right? right. Like, like the last guys <laughs> yeah. that you want to ask about the bottom of us. And I got to tell you, yeah. the worst thing that could ever happen is we buy the bottom. Because if I buy the absolute bottom, <laughs> I'm probably selling when things are up 20%. And I'm like, or the bottom, it's in, it's up 20, it's going down from here. So there's like no chance that I'm going to benefit from buying the bottom. It's yeah. wasted on me. It's wasted, 100%. No, I mean, the people ask us all the time, right? They're like, where's, you know, you guys, like, there's this confusion that, like, short sellers are somehow macroeconomic prognosticators, when in reality, oh, you know, you're Oh, I did. I was marketing last week. I was telling I everyone mean, you that I was a macro the prognosticating um, genius. Also, for future reference, if anyone I'm marketing to in the future sees this, I also understand macro. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, it's, but, yeah, I mean, like, you think about the macro environment of, like, where the bottom is and, you know, the the absence of marking down any of these private investments that only puts more selling pressure 
yes. on parts of the market that we don't see, right? And when a lot of these tiger cubs or these levered long funds that are you know reporting 25, 30, 40, mm -hmm. 50% down, they're gonna start getting redemptions soon. Yes. And where they before they were a buyer at any price, mm -hmm. when they're a seller at any price, you know, what happens to those private investments that they can't sell? Are they side pocketed? It's it's a good question. I think there are some funds who have dedicated private vehicles, there are some funds who co-mingle. Now the, yeah. the co-mingled model is incredibly dangerous yeah. on the way down because if you start marking your privates down, and, and it, again, it depends on the marking policies of these funds. Some people I assume have to do some sort of like mark to model type process. Other mm -hmm. people are probably marking at last, whether you are or aren't charging fees, there's different share classes. There's, there's a lot going on mm -hmm. to untangle there. but at a really base level, if you are not marking your privates down, your public piece is getting small and small. It is the only place you can get liquidity for redemptions. Yeah, that's right. And that ends up being a big problem because you're not the only person that knows this, your LPs are too. And right. so they likely don't want to be left holding the bag with a bunch of privates in a commingled vehicle if liquidity is getting sucked out of your public market bet. So And you're not the only fund that is undergoing the same process. Right. And the if when a subset or a no, large number of funds start doing the same thing at the same time, yeah. all of the pressures that worked when the market was going up that sent stocks into the stratosphere just work in the reverse on the way down. Um, it's gonna be, you know, and so you ask questions like where's the bottom? You know, it's hard from a macroeconomic standpoint to to make an estimate as a short seller, but you do know there's a lot of selling pressure. And that selling pressure, I don't think has even really begun. There's a lot of selling pressure and, you know, the world is super focused on hedge funds, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a really small part of real money. You know, we're all like every week, there's another like article on this, you know, prominent hedge fund or that one or a tiger cub. Like the reality is some even $20 billion hedge fund liquidating like 10, 15% of its book, 20, 30% of its book it's an absolute drop in the bucket. And what mm. happens is over a longer time period, you have like real money flows. Right. So you have the big long onies. I mean, those guys are managing hundreds of billions yeah. of dollars. We also have people withdrawing money from their retirement account to get liquidity. Right, yeah. drawing money from retirement accounts. You have fewer people in employment, so you have less of the mm. target date flows. That is the stuff that really moves the needle in terms of real money. And then you also have allocators. So whether it's endowments or pension funds, they have target allocations. Mm. And so, and some of these um, you know, endowments and pension funds, they actually have like distributions that they really need to make for students or yeah. for you know, people whose pensions that they have to pay out. So they're in a situation where again, depending on the amount of money they have allocated to private credit, private equity, venture capital, uh, vehicles that are locked up, uh, capital commitments for mm. drawdown type structures, they may also be in a situation where the only place they can really find liquidity to sell is public markets. And I don't mean hedge funds per se, I mean large portfolios of stocks they own. So to my mind, sentiment is incredibly bearish. I mean, that's the kind of unusual thing here. It's, it's mm. kind of consensus from everyone that markets are going lower at some point in the mm. next few months, the the level of bearishness kind of you know, varies from person to person, but it certainly seems to be like pretty sentiment driven. The question is for me, like, do you get this massive glut of real money selling mm. or not? And if you don't, yeah, maybe we are like slightly nearer a bottom and a top, who really knows? But if you do get this real money flow, I mean, you could see like huge legs lower in, in the stuff that people love and don't want to sell, where it's an Apple or, okay, I'm struggling to think of a stock mm. that's still up. Uh, Berkshire. <laughs> yeah. Berkshire. Berkshire. Yeah. 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 Like um, so I think, I think for me, that's interesting. And the other thing that we're really starting to just see is like how fucking poor some of these business models were. I mean, let's... <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about Klarna. Klarna. Incredible. Um, one of my friends actually was participating in that very last round that they did. I think it was last fall, their last raise. Okay. And hilariously, he what, was, what price was that at? It was it was like the type of it it was it was the price. I think it was at their top valuations, so was about 70 billion. Okay. And he was also paying a 
a um, like a seven to ten percent fee on top of the placement. So there like, was like a way in fee. Yeah, there was like a way in fee because someone was marketing the deal to him. It was just egregious that people were paying that. Um, but what was remarkable is that like, you know, Klarna, for those of you who don't know, uh, valued about 70 billion. The comps, all the buy now, pay later comps were basically at all time highs, something mm -hmm. like a firm after pay, which was acquired by Square. Um, Klarna was using an aggressive mark essentially based on the public comps, mm -hmm. which, you know, you can argue whether it's fair. Um, but if you use the public comps to mark yourself up to 70 billion and you use the public comps today, the real number is you're down 70 to 80%. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think what I found actually pretty amazing is like, these guys are fucking hemorrhaging. Hemorrhaging money. Money. Like, hemorrhaging money. They, I mean, they announced today, they announced a series of layoffs, but that doesn't really stop the bleeding because if no. you look at, you know, Klarna in their latest financials that were disclosed, what, 15 billion in revenue? Yeah. And, Four billion in credit losses off yeah. of that. If you're losing a third of your revenue to essentially credit losses, and the pain hasn't really started in the broader market, mm -hmm. and then you have, and you're and you're so EBITDA and cash flow negative, you're just. I, th I think it's interesting, like yeah. that that whole point about like the pain. There's, there's a lot of debate about the consumer right. and, and and housing a little bit, and I I hope all the bears are wrong on housing because I now own one. Uh, so I really strongly identify with the bullish trends there. But <laughs> going back to the consumer, the, the credit card data has actually not been that bad. And I, right. I don't religiously follow it. Like some, you know, I've read a few sell side reports recently, kind of with the, you know, I think it was like the March or April data. And I think what's interesting about that is default rates haven't massively spiked. And actually cash bank balances are still better than they were, I think, for most people than pre-pandemic. And so I wonder how much of that is masked by the Afterpay, the Klarna, mm. whatever it is, Block or thing, Square, whatever the board, like how much of that is like someone being able to tap like a couple thousand dollars for a short period of time off balance sheet and then they go to their credit card provider because they know that's going to show up on a credit score. Because I, I don't think the buy now, pay later guys actually do like a hard credit pull, right? It's some like kind of like quasi soft credit pull thing. So you you just kind of wonder, are we about to get hit with like a deluge of really bad data? Well, the, for example, subprime like auto loans, those have started to roll over a little bit, which is pretty concerning. Yeah. Um, Almost and... as concerning as... If you're Apollo, you just funded that Carvana <laughs> 2030. Yeah. Or if you're Tiger and you decided to rotate out of your more like risky growth stocks and pile into Carvana in Q1. Yeah. Like that. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's, <laughs> that's going to go down with like one of the greatest ever by the dip calls. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, he's laugh they're all laughing all the way to the bank. I know. But, I mean, um, some of those guys might have to get a job with Ross Gerber. <laughs> 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 it's not that bad. Yeah, it's not that bad. <laughs> uh, Jamba Juice is hiring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Yeah, so I think they'll be fine. A um, couple of funny things. We definitely said don't trust us on macroeconomic predictions and then spent the next 10 minutes giving our macroeconomic predictions. That was good. Yeah, like but that. we had the disclaimer on the bottom. We have the disclaimer. The disclaimer it's like, is hugely, yeah. hugely important. Right. It's the it's the equivalent um, to like smoking cigarettes, right? Like we all know it's bad, but if you do want to go and talk to a girl smoking cigarettes, you, you got to go over and smoke your own cigarette. You know, I was just in Brazil for a, a friend's wedding, mm -hmm. and smoking is one of those interesting global trends. You just don't see it in the United States, and you go true. and you go abroad. You and do the see number it. of people that still smoke. It's it's makes me want to buy Altria. <laughs> So it's, it's interesting, actually. There was a, a company that Altria bought mm. uh, or have bid for called Swedish Match. And um, Swedish Match, like the Swedish Match from Ivar Kruger back in the day? The Swedish Match from Ivar Kruger. No uh, yeah. yeah. Um, they have a, a product, uh, like a smokeless tobacco, like a little pouch thing that you, you put in your mouth. And it's, it's growing like gangbusters. And um, John Hampton wrote this piece. I think it's his largest position i've long followed his blog and unfortunately <laughs> he doesn't write as much anymore i, I wish he would I'm, I'm pretty sure his compliance guy was like hey you're running a lot more money now like yeah. 
don't write mean things, but he wrote this awesome blog post about how like, you know, actually they're paying a really cheap price for the company and the management team are complete ass clowns and just like landed <laughs> yeah. in a, uh, I think it was like, he gave some great quote, like landed in a pot full of rainbows and dicks or something. And just <laughs> like, you know, it was some brilliant quote. I'm butchering it. I, I strongly recommend you look it up. And, um, you know, it, it kind of like got me thinking like, there are all these like really interesting things that just because we're sat in a place in the world and we use the yeah. product. And I think for a lot of these tech businesses, that's what people extrapolated out, whether it was Peloton or Zoom or whatever. They're like, I'm a user of the product, like sweet green, like, hey, I see it on every I corner. I paid $20 for a salad. I Other pay... people are going to too. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think it's really funny how when you like take these kind of things that we do as consumers, and you like extrapolate it out and you know, you go and look back and you're like, what were we thinking, right? Like a, a Peloton yeah. is just, you know, a bike well, with an iPad on it. I mean, consumer products is a, is a harder investment to analyze, usually a harder investment to kind of get a sense of what the convergence is to intrinsic value. And the reason is the consumer products are generally more popular with retail, right? Yeah. Um, you know, what were the names during the pandemic, you know, stuff like GameStop, you know, incels buying video games. Like mm -hmm. they. They they knew that business. They go into movie theaters, AMC. They they <laughs> Bed Bath and Beyond. Like I don't really that one doesn't make a ton of sense. But the um, you know, it's consumer products are a little bit more difficult for that for that very reason, right? You just have mm -hmm. so much availability bias, which basically just informs the analysis whether you like it or not. It's really hard to strip that out. But it's availability bias, as you said, just conditioned onto whatever mm -hmm. like, you're seeing in your right. you know your your consumer interactions. And I, I think that kind of ties into the whole ESG point as well, because, you know, here we are, like traditionally tobacco has been shunned as, mm. as an ESG play. And a lot of people are under pressure to allocate to things that are, you know, more ESG friendly. So we just saw today Glencore settled, um, yeah. I think, with the Department of Justice and a bunch of other agencies for about one point five billion pounds or dollars. Mm. Uh, and the stock went up. And. A lot of people have shunned Glencore. There is, um, you know, an activist trying to get them to spin off their coal business, and that is making an ungodly amount of money at the moment. I, I think Dan Loeb might have written his letter that, uh, you know, they own some Glencore because mm. of that. And there's, there's this real kind of signaling thing, which is a, leading to certain funds really overstepping in terms of selling their ESG credentials. Right and other asset classes being massively shunned. Um, yeah. As a short seller, do you look for stuff that's kind of wearing the ESG halo? Do Absolutely. you not care? Do you? ESG has become the biggest area of research mm -hmm. for us. And I think probably for many short sellers, it is a, at, at a very high level, the fundamental problem is that in theory, ESG, especially the environmental investment, might be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, however, there are so many dollars that are being allocated to it by mandate. So passive flows, the Black Rocks of the world, mm -hmm. which get very politically controversial these days in the US. But there's so high of a mandate to invest in ESG. And there's so few companies that are actually worthy of investment mm -hmm. that there's too many dollars chasing, chasing few, too few good ideas. And that, of course, attracts all the charlatans yep. and attracts all the stock promoters. And, you know, well, you look at any given space and you say, well, there's two to three reasonable ESG investments there. However, you know, there's billions upon billions of capital that needed basically to be dumped into the sector. Mm -hmm. They're going to dump it into 10 to 15 companies that are just other pieces of shit. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, as a short seller, what you're always trying to do is you are following where the froth is, right? Yep. You are following what is the hottest space because you know that the hottest space today usually is going to attract the most disreputable characters tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's where you kind of focus your time and research. So ESG now is in this space where, you know, so many of the good companies are just trading at crazy valuations. Mm -hmm. They're insanely overcapitalized. And the money has just flowed to this like subset of ESG investments, which are just, you know, you combine that with SPAC's ability to like make whatever projections they sort of felt like. No, you think yeah. they did that? Yeah, I mean, they might do that. We'll find out. <laughs> find out, yeah. Yeah, and so for sure. I mean, with you guys too, right? I think you're looking at ESG. Yeah, we, we spent we spent a decent amount of time on it. Mm. I mean, we shorted 
XL Fleet Corp. Uh, I'm gonna say that was uh, February, March of last year. It's, it's actually amazing. That is now actually trading significantly below its its cash value. So that makes sense because they probably burn so much every quarter. This right? is the funny thing. It's actually not burning that much huh. money. So what is what is truly unique about that is so here's a company that we're projecting they were gonna do about 280 odd million in sales mm. this year. They've only done 4.5 uh, <laughs> or maybe 4.8 this quarter, but you know it's it's going to be a story of year of two halves, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And three quarters of that was to a related party, but the, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Small details. Yeah, the CEO's mom bought just like four trucks. <laughs> like. Um, and so what's kind of really interesting is that is we we actually looked and thought, hey, is is this something to do here? I mean, they're not burning that much cash. They don't seem to have a ton of liabilities. Could you just scrap the whole thing? And there are these uh, there are these rights, I think they're called Revlon uh, rights. Revlon duties. Revlon duties. Yeah. And um, what is... Flashback, hashtag corporate lawyer. <laughs> God, did you go to Harvard as well? Just so you, you know, can get in all your favorite that. topics. Yeah, <laughs> did you know that? <laughs> um, so what's really interesting is based on Revlon duties and, and some kind of preliminary work we've done, the directors of these companies stand less chance of getting sued if they take the enormous pile of money which dwarfs the market cap and literally lights it on fire than they do getting sued from existing shareholders if they just div out all the cash. It is the most yeah. mind-blowing conflict of interest. Now, again, with Excel Fleet Corp, there, there potentially could be some liabilities because I think there are numerous shareholder suits related to some of the work we mm -hmm. did. Um, so there would be this kind of like strange irony, but I, I just find it bizarre that the people who are but, such yeah. crap stewards of capital have this incentive to burn more capital as opposed to returning it to investors. But, you know, I bet if you looked at the, the the shareholding of some a lot of those board members, they have very little financial interest to dividend it out. Right. Because I mean, what, whereas what, before what, they just had very little interest, full stop. Right. Well, before they were interested in a continuing directors' fees yes. and b playing golf and not having that disrupted. Yes. But you know, this is a point that you know, say what you want about Elon. Elon, I think, correctly made with respect to Twitter. Yeah. Was that. None of the board actually use, really use it. None of them own any stock. Yep. How are they aligned with the incentive of shareholders? And how do they understand the best future for this product? Now, Nate did some great work, I thought, on, on, mm -hmm. on the Twitter thing. I thought it was a great piece that he published. And, you know, do you think he gets it done? I don't know. Like, I think he gets it done at a lower so, price. It's super interesting. I mean, snap, I, yeah, snaps down like 50%. You yeah. got to look at that comp and say, I'm paying less for this. You know... I think what's really interesting is Twitter probably has been like under monetized, whatever that means. Uh, Snap is just a shit platform. I bet uh, Miranda Kerr is wishing she stayed with Joe Low now, um, <laughs> given he's actually got some cash. Uh, don't worry, Evan, I'm joking. He's still my boy. Um, so um, I, th I think what's really interesting is the dock is pretty tight, okay? So if Dark's you tight. look at the Twitter deal, there's not wiggle room. Now, he might be trying with the bots thing, which he, P.S. has like repeatedly been bitching about prior to that. I, I don't think yeah. a judge is going to take kindly. Delaware judges are a real thing. This is not some Mickey Mouse pretend no. like you can bully. This is a very serious... The Chancery Court takes the work very seriously. Right. I think the trade here is for like Elliot to step in and I think the spread's probably in like the 30s now and say, you know, what, we're going to buy 10% of this. They, I think they either currently own stock or previously, yeah, sue for performance. Yeah. And be like, you know what, Elon, you are a big swinging dick, but I'm like Paul Swinger, uh, Paul, Paul Singer. Paul Swing. Dude, get that in there. Yeah. Paul Swinger. I like Different that. guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm Paul Singer and like, I'm a pretty sharp guy and I probably know more about this than you do. It seems like maybe you got a little bit carried away and, and overpaid and I think I can force you to perform. And mm. I think that's super interesting because I'll tell that's you what, if Elon gets away with repricing this deal, Every merger arb spread on the planet should probably widen because every single CEO is just gonna be like, you know what? If you act a little bit crazy and you just kind of like push it a little bit, you can probably get every board on the planet to reprice a deal. And if you look at COVID, I don't think there were many deals that were repriced lower, if I if I remember correct. I, I think at the beginning of COVID, there were a bunch of deals that were repriced lower, but then 
everything went absolutely bananas. Yeah. So valuations went up, and so there was no point to reprice the deals anyway. So I think this is a this is a area of law that we would have seen sort of the specific performance mm-hmm. of merger arm play out a little bit more during COVID, but we really never got the chance because valuations rebounded so quickly. Um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Uh, you know, do they get specific performance? I, I look. I think he's correct in that it, the platform's under monetized, mm-hmm. but you know, does he just pay the billion and just? But that's not how it works. It's not how it works. Break fees are not like the oh, I've changed my not, mind. I changed my mind. It's not for walk for any reason. It's right. Yeah. And you know, Tesla's stock has has been sliding. Like all of a sudden, Tesla's you know, stock's been sliding. I mean, look at the comp set as we said earlier. Like XL know, Fleet Corp. XL Fleet Corp. Um, what was the one you did, the shit show uh, SPAC you, you published on? Heisen. Yeah. What yeah. is that, like down 90? Yeah, I think it's down pretty significantly. Yeah. It's like, I think, in the $3, 4 range. Gotcha. It'll, it'll um, be this soon. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you know, with, it, it'll be really interesting. I mean, it'll be really, like, we're going to start to see, I, I think one of the, the larger kind of predictions we have is is how when the market starts to shake out at these really high levels, you know, a guy like Elon has like, you know, he's not specifically, I don't think overly levered really. Mm -hmm. Like he's got obviously a ton of his net worth tied up in stocks, but he's also got some really decent exposure to like energy and SpaceX, which probably, you know, yeah, it's probably a good, you know, government contracts aren't going away. True. And so he's, he's somewhat hedged, I think in that, in that sense, but, man, the rotation out of some of these, you know, these high flying assets, like, you know, stable coins, crypto. Oh, dude, I, okay, I- Like, if they don't put that, like, if that guy doesn't go down, like, then- The Korean guy. Yeah, yeah. Do Kwan. I mean, like, it, you know, appears that given the collapse of it, there's also this great article in the Wall Street Journal today about whether they actually used the foundation, which was supposed to provide oh, essentially to prop relief up. to action. So they said that they transferred it to a wallet in order to trade to prop it up. Guess what? And guess what? There's some question about whether they actually did that. Um, if that turns out to be true, I don't know how. Wow. That's that that this starts to become one of the biggest frauds of all time, if that's the case. Yeah, I you know, it's funny. Um, uh, Mike Novogratz obviously got that Luna tattoo and um, I don't have any tats, but I, I'm probably thinking if I was to get one, a Luna tattoo would no, be dude, my... No, you got to get a tattoo of Mike Novogratz with the Luna tattoo. <laughs> so funny That's you say that. Meta. My colleague, Alex, um, typically the person with the Ivy League education at Muddy Waters um, is on the lowest rung of the totem pole. My colleague, Alex... Yeah, uh, you're intellectually insecure, obviously. So. <laughs> <laughs> my father did say that I should apply to Oxford on the basis that someone had to be bottom and I would have no problem <laughs> anchoring that. But, um, you know, what? it's funny. He uh, he was at Princeton, so he's going... They have like this big reunion and uh, I, I guaranteed him a higher bonus if he could get a picture like with the Novogratz Luna tattoo and... Uh, some thumbs up. I think if you tweet that to Novogratz, he actually might do it. Well, because he needs the cash now yeah. <laughs> for tattoo removal. Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's like the biggest like ex girlfriend tat. <laughs> like it's so brutal. <laughs> it really does suck. But um, yeah, look, the crypto thing is interesting. If I were gonna get a a tattoo, my friend actually a couple hours ago sent me. There's a there's a coin that you mine more by walking it's like somehow attached like the pedometer on your phone we'll uh we'll get it up on screen for uh for those who are interested um i i i would probably get that one like instead of like walking the walking one yeah like just so i could feel like better about having only done like two thousand steps a day i could be like oh actually i made like eight crypto whatever tons they are so uh (laughs) that's i wouldn't see it as a negative that i'd miss my ten thousand steps a day i'd be like Oh, I made a uh, eight dollars in uh, whatever these are. Oh, so it's it's you get coin based on the number of steps or the inverse? No, no, the number of steps. We should do the inverse. The couch, just the fat, couch coin. Yeah, the fat coin where you're just like cool. Like I get paid on the inverse of the amount of calories that I burn in a day. You basically index okay. it to your BMI. Yeah, okay. just like what's the burn that you should do as a reasonable person and whatever okay. you get. So look, if uh, you know. Sequoia. I don't or think anyone anyone's... can criticize that in this day and age. That would be shaming. 
That would be shit. Yeah, that's not appropriate. Okay, and you know what? I don't know if the Midwest has enough crypto, so uh, <laughs> let's get it going. Um, cool. Well, on that bombshell, I think we should end before uh, we get canceled. But hey, if we get canceled and uh, Carlson doesn't have monkeypox, he'll be back presenting anyway. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate cool. it. Pleasure. Thank you for coming in. All right, man.